online space is also white in and of itself, right? So when you search for people, you, you don't find a black face. If you still have uh, the delete button on Twitter or anywhere else, you need to start practicing that if you use change. There's very few cases of people being prosecuted for what they said on social media. And because of that, instead of just being a microcosm, it's actually closer to what people really are than real life. But as someone who performs his sexuality online, I find that many white people are so comfortable in sending their faces and their penises and genitals uh, more freely than black people are. But for a very long time, um, we, so most of us lie. It's the biggest lie. I've read the terms and conditions. Uh, but few of us actually ever have the ability, the time to actually read um, our terms and conditions. But right now, I'm going to not read all the terms and conditions. I have a summarized version of each and every term and condition of each and every social media that you engage on. I chose Facebook, WhatsApp, Twitter, Instagram, the ones that are most active on and I think the ones that society has been engaging on, exactly what you're signing up for. And this is the discussion with which I open um, this discourse around digital security. Yahoo's copyright license for photos, graphics, audios, and video limited for purpose. Yahoo's copyright license for group limited for purpose. Terms may be changed at any time at their discretion without notice to the user. You must provide your legal name up upon registration. Your, your account can be suspended. Now everyone's favorite hookup site, uh, Facebook. The service tracks you on other websites. Facebook automatically shares your data with many other services. Facebook uses your data for many purposes. The Android app can record sound and video from your phone at any time without your consent. So that's that ugly self of you and those nudes that you don't want to be public, Facebook has them. Um, my question is, and always has been, I think, is if privacy is truly important to you, which it is for some people, what then is the option, right? Um, because it's incredibly difficult to live in the modern age and not be on any social media or you know not have any apps at all on your on your kind of on your cell phone and if you don't have a smartphone you can't be in the business world so i think in a way the choice itself has been taken away from us because you can't function as a you know professional or as a social person in this society without these apps and I think if you subscribe to those sorts of things you are then entering into a sort of contract and therefore if you subscribe to Instagram or Facebook whether or not you might have read the terms and conditions you are still in effect willing to have parts of your life being put on those platforms so I think it's a it's a conscious decision, and fine, people may decide then to have their privacy settings changed and what they want to see on their timelines, but I think it's, you have to be cognizant of the fact that you are then allowing yourself, by being in that space, for your private life to be invaded. So I, it, you can't really stress people. I, I find a problem with people that hate their privacy invaded but whilst actively participating in those spaces. Can we put the blame completely on ourselves when it comes to privacy invasion, right? Can, can, we, can we really sit down and say that we signed up for it, even though there is legal agreements that we signed up for it? Now, the second point that I wanted to speak about is the inability 
of social media to allow freedom to cha for change. And I'm going to use uh, Trevor Noah and Mark Lemore as a site of conflict, as a site of politics. Because The Daily Show has recently been cancelled in more than three countries already. So the, in, the, 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 the inability uh, to evolve on social media, the fact that what you say um, is permanent and no one forgets it, it's something that they can archive. And it's something that society as well is using, right? That when I then one day become a public figure, maybe the misogynistic tweets from seven, eight years ago are going to come up and testify against me, even though there's been an evolution in my politics, right? So engage. So one of the tweets that Trevor Noah uh, has been getting a backlash for um, is what has been called anti-Semitism or the Jewish hate, where he says South Africans know how to recycle like Israel knows how to be peaceful. It's not so much social media's inability to see evolution, it's more human, well, my belief that in human nature, right, the fact that a lot of people get joy and entertainment out of seeing the downfall of somebody else, right? So, you know, your example earlier of um, uh, saying love by Macklemore, right? When the song came out, everybody loved it, you know, it's so progressive, whatever, whatever. As soon as he starts to, well, getting nominated for Grammys, actually, hold on, everything's not so cool. Look, he did this, he did that. People seem to love jumping on to the bad, right? And especially on, you know, Twitter and other social media. And I think that's the biggest issue with social media, is it allows us to extenuate that a lot more greatly than we would in personal interaction, because there's also kind of that distance and pseudo-anonymity. Mm. That's why the problem in terms of like language, in terms of itself, how a person would like, let's say, express themselves either through like, let's say, a serious issue to basically a satirical issue such as Trevor Noah. Trevor Noah was possibly being sarcastic as it was, although some other school of thoughts of people would say that no, he was being malicious. That differentiation in terms of like what, what certain words or what certain situations mean to different individuals could be also problematic in terms of like the online media actually viewing things where like they basically view things in black and white where pretty much in general most things can be put in between saying that you know what there isn't no black and white it's just as gray as it is it's how to take it social media culture is that people disguise bullying essentially cyber bullying as online freedom so a person will say like as you've mentioned so maliciousness or intent um, how do you differ like, differentiate between intent and whether the, the, the tweet um, actually has harm? But I, I feel like social media culture right now is just people are malicious. I have the intent to be malicious and disguise it as online freedom. So if someone is called out for that maliciousness, they then, then say it is an infringement on their online freedom. So. I think it, 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 it's linked because, I mean, fine, we can say maybe um, harm, like that person didn't mean any harm, or as TC was saying, it, it, it's relative of how you read it, but I feel like right now, actually, people have tried to make it more of a gray area where in some instances it actually just is black and white. That person wanted to be malicious. But in, in, in other terms of people use so that history so when they dig up your history to then also be malicious so it, it so I think um, like if it's a tweet from five years ago it, it's definitely not a reflection of your character or who you are but I do think that it's important that people blow it out of proportion intentionally because what that does is that it like conscientizes other people to know that saying something like this is wrong. So even after Trevor Noah came out and apologized for what he said, or even if Macklemore released, you know, one of the, you know, most profound mm -hmm. songs in the LGBT uh, discourse, it's important that people sort of like target him for the stuff that he said five years ago and almost demonize the things that he said, because that 
like straighten society and makes them realize that saying things like that is not right at any point. So um, as much as I think, yeah, on a personal level, we should forgive Trevor Noah and forgive Michael Moore, I don't think we should go easy on them when it comes to demonizing the things that they said because um, it's not normal and it's not right and many people need to know about it. So. And also around parody accounts, right? The idea of parody accounts and the idea of the separation from, from, from the online spaces. Are you really, really separate from your Twitter account? Um, we're looking at social media as a drag, as a performance, right? To say, when I go there, it's what I perform. Right? But is the drag separate from, from the subject of the person performing the drag? So what I want to say, uh, most of this is kind of response to what Bongani said earlier. The issue is you need to have the ability, <laughs> you need to have the ability to change your mind, right? You need to have the ability to let your views evolve. And if you're being forced to defend views that you made, five, six, seven years ago, I mean, as social media gets older with us, right? You're then not being allowed to really change your views because in being attacked, people's natural uh, reaction is to defend their views, right? Which might, not, might no longer be what their true views are, right? And secondly to that, you've got to understand, we love this idea of discourse and having all these opinions and all that, and that's brilliant, right? But you've got to remember that in having all these opinions, you also then allow people to have opinions which might not be the same as your own, right? They might not be the same as what most of society thinks, but they're still entitled to have that opinion, voice that opinion if they want, and that's kind of how, you know, discussion works, is that people have opinions which five years ago they said, and you might not agree with now. I think if you still have uh, the delete button on Twitter or anywhere else, you need to start practicing that if your views change. Because if five years ago you tweeted about something, and then when you tweet about something different today, and when we go back to say, wait, you said this five years ago, account for that. That's the discourse that you want, I think, interested. Where then we need, you then have to tell us, okay, I've changed my views, I'm no longer the same person. I think it's also evident with, I think, Bonan's tweets, uh, we just discussed it the other day, that she, 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 she was of the view, she was, she was of the view of uh, assuming that she cheated, that she was of the view that it's wrong to cheat uh, or, or take, someone's, take someone's man, and then that was five years ago, but now they're asking her, what have you done? What, what account for that tweet five years ago? So I think for the discourse to happen, we have to account and we have to hold you accountable for five years' tweets. Or you are still the same person, I think, you might change your uh, your 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 RVs and your pictures again, but you're still the same person who tweeted that tweet. So you have to account for those tweets. But I've been reading the terms and conditions for you, and most of these social media says even the deleted stuff is really not deleted, right? And when you become famous, um, other competitors can say can speak to Facebook and want to have a history, even though it's deleted, right? So. If you have a dirty account on Twitter or you post a picture of your nudes, uh, you may go and deactivate and delete that account, but it's something that will be available to the world for as long as Earth exists. Uh, this is an article written uh, in 29 April 2015. It is titled, You're Being Spied On. It's written by Nicola Mewson, a contributor. It says, South African citizens are the subject of ele electronic surveillance by state security officials who tap phones and intercept communication. Two reports released this week reveal. The Right to Know spokesperson, Moray, says electronic surveillance happens, but it is almost impossible to detect. Legal requests are granted under a specific judge under the RICA Act. However, claims a right to know campaign there are known examples in which authorities seemingly misled the judges into granting permission for calls to be monitored and international communication is not regulated under RICA. It has been long suspected this kind of surveillance is sometimes undertaken without a judge's permission. I think it's very important to remember what, um, what the internet actually has been able to do for our personal freedoms, right, and for sovereignty 
for people as a whole. So while there is this scary kind of thought of it being able to take away our freedom of privacy, we also then have to look at groups like Anonymous that ensure that companies are not doing anything specifically incredibly malicious, who are currently going against ISIS um, you know, in a much more substantial way than the US or the UK have been able to, and who played a major role in the Arab Springs by giving internet access to people in Egypt and Syria who didn't have internet access because of the dictators there before. So while we may think that the internet is taking away freedom, at the same time it's giving us more freedom than we've ever had before. I'd just like to ask a personal question to you. As someone who's kind of chosen to use the internet and, and you know the cyberspace as a, a place where you have very intimate and private relations, how has the idea of your privacy being, being invaded in those spaces inputted on your decision? Um, you know, to still have Skype sex when you know that Zuma could be watching anyway. It's always been a problem where like basically when you go from like platforms like let's say the media in terms of itself, like i.e. traditional media being newspapers and also like, you know, usual like correspondence and stuff like that. We've always been at the short end of a stick that, like, that everyone here has to acknowledge. I mean, this was a very true fact in the book 1984, where like the persona of the state being Big Brother, that persona has always been perpetuated. It's now been extended more, where like our governments, especially like a very good explicit example is basically South Africa in terms of like um, what happened this year in terms of that article. Even more explicitly is the U.S., especially with instances involving the NSA and possibly um, uh, Edward Snowden in terms of like access to information and personal information. That we cannot tolerate as a population in terms of being citizens in our society. Because since when does the government have the obligation or the right to say that, no, we're going to invade in your own personal space for for all purposes to whether to screen you, whether you're either going to be a threat to society or whether you're going to be actually, or whether you're actually just a normal citizen. Using that own information to coerce it, to try and prove to you, or even try to manipulate it to make you into an enemy of the state is highly problematic. We cannot condone for such actions like that, and thus we feel that as a population or a populace within a state, we should not tolerate governments busy already curbing the already free spaces and also our own freedom on the online platform. The internet is, a, is an expressive space for individuals in this day and age to be able to express themselves in ways they think or view necessary. And I think it's an extension of people. So if you're on a Facebook account, that's just a, a virtual extension of like yourself in real, in real time, expressing yourself how you will on the internet through WhatsApp, Twitter, or whatever. And I think that like, Allowing the state, um, or at least allowing companies to be able to look into your pictures, your photos, your videos, hack into all of your devices and stuff, creates a big brother industry. And the big brother industry, considering the fact that none of these companies are African owned, or South African owned, Twitter, Facebook, um, Grindr, WordPress, these are, the, these are all international companies that, are, that, are, that, are, that have access to your information, access to whatever information they need in the country, whatever they can do, I think that it, it speaks to a bigger pitch that like not many people are looking at the, the issue of national security. So like if an American company can have access to South African people and how they live and how they live their lives, they're able to tell um, what, what your, your propensity towards violence, your propensity towards certain things, they can dictate, they can preempt your actions before you make them and that gives their government a better chart or a better um, position, puts their government in a better position than yours to deal with any problems that might come from that. And I think that that's something we need to consider um, consciously. So if we're a South African government, would we allow Twitter to be able to hack into the phones of South Africans, considering that like, these are our sovereign citizens on our own space, before we can even have the discussion about whether our government should be allowed to look into our phones for whatever purposes. The real issue is, is Twitter, should Twitter be allowed to, to look into a, a South African citizen's phone? 
should Facebook bail out the same thing? Should Google bail out those things? Because I think that there are things governments are able to do that can prevent those things from happening that aren't being done currently. And that's a very, very huge problem for me personally, just, just in terms of national security. But as someone who performs his sexuality online, I find that many white people are so comfortable in sending their faces and their penises and genitals uh, more freely than black people are. When I engage with a black person and we are sharing nudes, I'm always dealing with the half-cropped image, right? It's like, it's like half-human visuals, right? That I, so it also shapes my experience of how I engage with sexuality in that space, right? The, the internet isn't always a safe space and social media isn't always a safe space for minority identities, but it's also been a great opportunity to give voice to minority identities. And you see there's been a huge burgeoning of like a whole lot of um, gay blogs and LGBTIQ um, blogs and uh, and, and all sorts of accounts on social media. So I think in that sense, it has actually uh, been quite helpful in advancing the agenda of like minority identities and people. Yeah, um, it's been uh, quite interesting navigating the cyberspace because I mean, when you exist, you exist in many different spaces, like you can exist in the rural, you exist in the urban. So um, I exist with white people, I exist with black people, but when it comes to expressing myself, I mean, um, media, uh, it's, it's sometimes a, a thin line between what you know, I'm comfortable, it, it's tricky because sometimes you don't know whether what you're saying is, um, you know, as, as a person navigating you know, the black consciousness thing, uh, it's, it's tricky and it's hard to you know, sort of express those views sometimes because you know that some of the friends that you have might not feel comfortable with you expressing those things. So I don't know if I'm completely free. I don't know if that's a personal thing or like with me dealing with myself and whatever, but I mean, it's a bit tricky. Mm. ...of yourself as a minority, and the other one is how minorities are perceived um, through social media. So within this conversation, we have to remember what we were speaking about before, and that in many ways, the internet is just a microcosm of people and of your own personality. So I think it's unrealistic to expect complete equality as to how people act on social media when there isn't complete equality as to how people act in the real world. So if you feel as though there's still different cultures being pervasively entrenched within our society between races, let's say, then those cultures don't disappear when you go onto the internet. Then if you've been brought up in a more private way, you're still going to be more private in the, on the internet. Um, so I think that's the first thing in terms of, you know, maybe seeing how races interact differently on the internet, races interact differently in the real world. I would actually argue instead of social media being a microcosm of society, it's actually a more true form of society. Um, the reason I would argue that is it speaks to something that, um, so there's a psychiatrist, Philip Zimbardo, who wrote a book called The Lucifer Effect. And in that he speaks about how when you remove personal connection, people are willing to be a lot more evil than they would in a personal relation, in an act where that personal interaction is still there. And because of that, in social media, if you're not of the majority, which in the world is white males, then you're, you know, especially homosexuals on the internet, uh, people with, you know, divergent religious views and all that type of stuff, will get attacked a lot more harshly on the internet and on social media than they would in real life because of that Lucifer effect. Because there's very few cases of people being prosecuted for what they said on social media. And because of that, instead of just being a microcosm, it's actually closer to what people really are than real life. I think a simple example of what Tristan is saying is that if I am in a room and I say something that people of a different race don't like for whatever racist reasons, 
they don't react as harshly as they do in the comment sections on the internet. And I think that's where on the internet because they don't, they don't have real identities or they don't have tangible identities. They're able to do and say whatever it is that they want to say with little ramifications as they would in um, a more physical space. My response is as follows. In terms of like whiteness, in terms of onlineness, it shows that there is an imbalance in terms of like power dynamics, in terms of like basically the online space in terms of itself. That we cannot like basically ascribe certain things like that. Even though like some people say that mm, maybe whiteness has got a point here and there, but let's be honest, let's just say things as it is. Whiteness sometimes actually falls short in terms of dealing with such issues in terms of race. They, on certain occasions, when they like generalizing certain things, are not getting to the cause of it. They are basically alienating us from the main issue in hand when we're trying to force the main issue to be dealt with. There's no way running away from it. There's no way backtracking it. There's no way of just saying, no, I want to dodge this main issue. Online space is also white in and of itself, right? So when you search for people, you don't find a black face, right? When you search for dreadlocks, you don't find a, a, a black a black face. When you search for black, you find images of like black dark gothic things or whatever it is, right? So it's it's so I feel like as a black person online, I'm I'm at least my job, but what I feel like I'm doing constantly is either contributing to content or literature or African literature or whatever forms of art that don't exist. And if it is on one page, I put it on my Tumblr, I put it somewhere else. I feel like what how I tag with the online space, the black person is constantly trying to put myself there so that you know I, I can find these things, or someone who comes after me can find themselves and these things online. Okay, you had a hand up, yeah. I wanted to talk about the idea of intellectual property. The, how do we engage with intellectual property, um, and how do we, and how when I say engage, I mean how also do we mobilize against or if we're actually fine in being complicit around intellectual property. But there's also been quite a very emerging way of, journal, of, of, of journalism uh, where people are using memes. Every one of, of us in this room is a meme potential. I look at you in that resting bitch face. I'm like, I want that face. I'm going to capture it, you know? Here, tweeting for hard talk. See, what I just want your face. That's basically what I want. I don't want to be tweeting about the event. And then one day, when I want a tweet to go viral, and I just want to troll someone, I'm like, your face was the best response to what has been said, or what I'm trying to say. And I put out that face. Because when you look at the fact that Part of signing up to be online is uh, is expecting that some of these things actually are going to happen. Your picture are going to be circulated. You never own them once you put them out there. So is there a need to actually contest around the fact that people are being memes all the time? And most of the time it's black women who are being memes. Like a couple of my colleagues have used memes <laughs> on me. <laughs> yeah. And they have taken like, you know, certain pictures saying that, okay, let's just, uh, you know, make a meme about it. Slowly but surely with time, I actually just had to acknowledge the fact that realistically, the whole meme culture is kind of entertaining. It's kind of like satirism, mocking each other in a certain moment where like that picture would have had a context of that certain situation now being perpetuated in other situations. However, I do admit that it can be troublesome when like basically memification can go into veterization, which I'm like, okay, that is too extreme, you guys need to stop. This is becoming a very dangerous habit and it becomes like, you know, too annoying. So for example, I think with tweets, they're basically a manifestation of what's acceptable in real life in terms of how you would like tease each other and stuff like that, right? So if in a social setting, a very small social setting, someone like TC is known to have random outbursts or I'm known to be obnoxious or whatever the case is and we, you know, we take pictures of each other, make a meme and, and then share it in a WhatsApp group that we, share, that we share. I think instances like that are fine and they're acceptable because it's the same as us hanging out at the Matrix and then teasing this guy for being like super short or whatever, and it's acceptable in that social setting. I think at such a point where you betray the code of your social setting and you put it on online media, that's the equivalent of turning your back on your friends when you're in a larger group 
and suddenly introducing the jokes that are acceptable in your small circle to the rest of the public. So if between Tristan and I, like me dissing him about his blue eyes or whatever is funny, that's great. But as soon as I start making it acceptable for other people who aren't in our circle to do that, it betrays like that sort of amicable spirit that we have in our friendship, uh, 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 which, you know, which allows for teasing each other and so on. So that's where I think the boundary is really. Uh, I think I like what you, I think you raised a very interesting point over there. Um, the, I think what we maybe need to interrogate is the, the very small difference between um, like the way pictures are used or circulated in the corporate space and in the social, more personal space. So a company can't use your photograph for promotion without your permission, right? So they can't go and sell a brand without having paid you for that image because they're using your image to get money for themselves. But then at the very same time, paparazzi can take a photo of anyone, any celebrity, and it goes into People magazine and people make way more money because there was a photo of Kanye West and Kim Kardashian or whatever. And when it comes to memes as well, um, anyone can take a photo of yourself and throw it around anywhere that they want to throw it around. So I think when you're interrogating that, you then need to look at the, 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 the difference between the corporate space. Why in certain instances, corporate companies will have to pay you first before they use your image and then why in a social space that doesn't happen. I think um, while we can't stop people from obviously like taking photos and making memes of them, what we can do is try to deter that kind of behavior and disincentivize that kind of action by maybe copywriting your image because you are your own property and you are allowed to say, Yo, look, uh, I don't want any of my photos anywhere out there. If I see a photo of myself, you got to pay me. If you don't pay me, I'm going to you know, sue you for everything that you're worth. It's very possible to do those kind of things in certain countries. I think if you were to do it here, yeah, it would be okay. Um, I don't think it's possible to stop people from making memes. It is impossible. I don't think it's possible. But what you can do is to make them pay you for making a meme. And you'd make a hell of a lot of money every single time you saw your face on Nine Gag or any social network. And the thing with memes is I feel like in our societal context, we understand that they often get given meanings very different to what they come from, right? The idea of the success kid meme, which is the famous one of the little kid going like this, is actually just him eating sand. It's quite a common known thing and it's quite commonly known that memes are just looks which are attributed to different contexts. That's why it is a meme, right? It is a meme because it is a look, a frown, a facial expression, which when given a different context becomes very funny. And that's the idea, that's the entire idea of a meme. And that's why I think that, you know, really, yeah, you know, you might not like that you're being a meme and everybody know, knows your face, but I don't think it's the most detrimental, detrimental thing that can happen to you on the internet, right? Yes. And also the regulation around institutions we already exist in a job um, and the fact that the, you are now you are now being forced somehow uh, into representing a brand that you are part of but it was never explicit in the fact that now because you work for this company you need to carry yourself this particular way and this seems to be an exception most of the time in online spaces whereby uh, you see that there's no regulation of what people do when they're outside of that space, but that space is also public, right? So the company is okay in hiring a homophobe, uh, in homophobe if, if, if that person is not a homophobe online, but in the outside space, they're, they're, they're free to be able to do whatever that they do. So the engagement of, 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 of big companies uh, or companies around how the social is both private and public at the same time. And also looking at how institutions play uh, with their own laws, right? That if you cut, so if that exists as an institution, it has a right to say, these are, this is how you choose to represent that university if you're part of it. This is how you speak about that university. Um, so, so, so how then does that shape your experience? Are you always cognizant of what you're putting out there because one day you're going to potentially lose your job? Earlier, Gunyai actually was talking about how the fact that your social media and your online presence is an extension of who you are, right? And therefore, in my opinion, 
yet companies should be able to use what you put online to judge who you are. Because remember, they're also looking at your character to see if you would fit into a company. That being said, it also goes back to what I was saying right at the beginning, where you've got to understand, though, also that just due to the longevity of the internet, right, the fact that you can go back and search to things that happened in 2009, like in the case of Trevor Noah, right, you've got to understand that that might not necessarily be the views of today. So it's kind of, it's a fine line to walk and that you've got to understand that, yeah, it is, you know, their social media, their online presence this is an extension of who they are, right? But at the same time, it might not still be who they are. The fact of the matter is, companies and especially, and especially the work, um, the workspace should not be using basically your online let's say profile basically as like the basis of employing you because sometimes you're pretty much like your personification on the line is not basically who you are potentially that is a fact as it is I mean views change people kind of like change their views over a space of period of time I'm not saying they're gonna change it like let's say in a matter of minutes a day or a year it could change in basically like give or take five years so that change is basically the basis in itself. If that change in terms of basis is workable. But then in terms of like basically defining you to get that job, it kind of is a bit unfair because you're kind of like depriving somebody who could contribute the most for that company at the end of the day. It determines on what you actually want to do or I think it would, it would actually be fair for you to actually give account um, of whatever it was that you did post. I mean, um, an example would be Trevor Noah. Um, well, knowing him and how many people know him today uh it goes without saying that he would have probably made the same joke last night uh given the kind of material that he uses in his one-man shows um on his posts today and so on so i think it um and as we mentioned earlier that uh, people's views change over time and i think it is important to say that even though um, someone may have had certain views over certain things at a certain period of time when they actually apply for a job that could um somehow i don't know um I think I want to say um, their chances of them getting that job could be somehow lessened by what they posted like five years ago. I think it would be important for them to actually come forward and give account to um, what they did post and actually like try and explain themselves. I think um, it, it is also uh, one's individual res uh, responsibility to make sure that they know that whatever it is that they put out there, um, they know that they'll have to one day give account for or take responsibility for it. Obviously, the online freedom has also existed in, in liberating spaces. Look at Roads Must Fall. Um, look at vit, look at Transform Vit. How there's been circulation of different materials across university. How the online space also transcends time and gives us way in giving partnership or solidarity with movements like BDS and participation around Arab Spring. Because mainstream media is also very particular in its form of reporting. How many people in Palestine? Uh, have actually been serving as researchers, as journalists, as they document their everyday life. The online space can be both violating, it can be also a space where you come and add me on Skype and we can have a good time. Thank you.